In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome to each and every one of you as we gather on this summer day in this very warm sanctuary. The one thing about warm sanctuaries is they make for shorter sermons, so we look forward to that. I want to thank our pianist, Laura Lee Carrier, for being here with us and singing today. Uh, Be Thou My Vision is one of my absolute favorite hymns, so it's nice to root ourselves in, in God as we start our worship service. We are in green, and you are sitting in green pews, thankfully. Um, Given the case count in Moncton over the past week or so, uh, the high number of cases, it was decided that we wouldn't sing today. It had been the plan that when we came back in green that we would be singing, Um, but to err on the side of caution and to also protect those among us who are uh, immunocompromised, uh, those who are uh, under 12, Uh, It just felt that we're just going to be safe just and keep an eye on things and we hope to be singing hymns very soon. So just, um, I'm sure all of you are feeling it as well. And um, it may seem like everywhere else is kind of wide open, but when you look at where the infections are happening, they're happening in places where there's no restrictions, i.e. restaurants. So um, we're going to just play it safe here at church because we care for you and because we want to keep each other safe. So thank you for understanding, although it does feel nice to walk into our own pews and to be able to sit together and to share in this space as we open things up more and more uh, as the church. I want to share with you the minute for mission that comes from the United Church of Canada Mission and Service Fund, and this is a story about disability. Everyone belongs. That belief anchors our United Church. It's why your mission and service gifts support gatherings of people who are left on the margins of society and support education events that help us learn what we can do about it. Disability is one aspect of social justice in the United Church that we are working on. Did you know that one in five Canadians live with at least one disability? That's 6.2 million people. Of these, 1.2 million can't afford AIDS, devices, or prescription medications. People living with severe disabilities have half the income of those with none. Seniors are almost twice as likely to have a disability as people who are of working age. Disability is an issue that affects us all. That's why the United Church partners with people from other denominations to raise awareness. People like Anglican disability activist Linda Katsuno, who is widely considered a pioneer in the field. Linda has lived with disability since she was in a car accident in 1973. At the time, she was a primary school teacher and loved her job working with children. Building a world where everyone belongs, Linda's story after the uh, Linda story uh, tells that she wasn't sure if she would be able to return to what she loved because school wasn't accessible. Linda credits a committed principal and board of education superintendent for making the changes that would enable her to return to her job. I became a disability activist when I realized it takes political will to change society for the better. Our community is made stronger when we include people with disabilities. If people with disabilities were fully welcome, the world would be a richer place. It would be a place where there, was no hope, where there is hope and no fear. Ideals of mutuality, inclusivity, and justice drive Linda's passion to make the world a better place for all. I don't want to be seen as poor, pathetic, 
I want to be seen as a child of God, she says. Your generosity supports events and education that help create healthy, strong, welcoming communities inside and outside the church. Communities where no one is left out, where we're all valued as children of God. Let's build a world where everyone belongs. Make your mission and service gift for belonging today. I'd invite you to join with me, it sounds nice to say that, in our call to worship in the bolded words. Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. O God, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. There is forgiveness with you, and I wait for you, O God. My soul waits for you. In your words, I hope, my soul waits for you, God, more than those who watch for the morning. Please join me in our prayer of approach. Let us pray. God of healing and transformation, we hunger and thirst for your abundant life. We bring you our sorrow and ask for the bread of joy. We bring you our despair and ask for the bread of hope. We bring you our weariness and ask for the bread of inspiration. Meet us here. We need the bread of heaven to sustain us for our journey to find our way, that we may be one with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we continue in confession. God, we confess that we often spoon-feed ourselves items and ideas that do not provide us the energy we need to do your work. This creates space between you and us, between ourselves and each other, as members of Christ's one body. Oftentimes, we are willing to risk our sustained health and well-being for immediate satisfaction. Take a moment of silence and reflection. Through Jesus, we have been given an example of one who was truly nourished and sustained by God. In Christ, we are forgiven, made whole, and restored to the one body. As you all continue to make your offering online or at the door of the church, we give you thanks for helping to sustain this church and its ministry during these difficult times as we experience this global pandemic together. And so we bless these offerings for their use. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Let us continue to offer ourselves in the service of God's kingdom. Let us pray together these words of dedication. O oh God, we share these gifts in the spirit of the one who is the bread of life, shared with us. We ask that you take these gifts and use them to feed all of creation. Amen. Now, in the interest of not interrupting our live broadcast where I normally turn the camera and lose the internet signal, I'm going to let Laura Lee sing. Those of you at home can listen, and all of us can uh, hear these words of, of the hymnist. Now the gospel according to John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
Then the authorities began to complain about him because he said, I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, don't complain amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except through the one who is of God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Let us pray. We come before you today, O God, in the weariness of this warm day, and we give thanks for this opportunity to gather as your people. May you bless our thoughts, bless our hearts, open us to compassion, and open us to you. Amen. According to the Globe and Mail last week, Canada has recovered about 92% of the jobs that we lost during COVID, as we watch our economy slowly edge to recovery. In fact, many are speculating that provinces such as Alberta and New Brunswick have dropped all COVID restrictions early due to the economy, even though cases of the virus are increasing. Not to mention here in Moncton, not only do we have COVID swirling around, you'll be lucky not to catch some brain disease or Legionnaire's disease when you're going to Sobeys. These times are boggling. We couldn't have envisioned or anticipated this in a lot of ways. According to the news, economists are warning that a full recovery of the economy will be a long slog ahead. Economist Royce Mendy says there's not a whole lot to complain about when the economy creates almost 100,000 jobs in a month. It's a sign of recovery, but not a sign of mission accomplished, accomplished he said. In many ways, this past year and a half has been about trying to keep people employed, keep children in school, all the while keeping the virus at bay, and not overwhelm our hospitals until a vaccine could be developed and given to the largest possible percentage of the population. We're all in this together, as everyone says, although it's more accurately to say we're in the same storm, but we're in very different boats. Chris Wigglesworth, who was a geologist, academic, and Church of Scotland minister, worked across the world on water and rural development and devoted his life to fighting for social justice. He wrote this, The economy is for God, which means it is also for my neighbor. It is for my neighbor, which means it is also for God. Here in Moncton, we've been struggling at a grassroots level and at government levels, trying to figure out how, those, how to help those who are on the streets. Groups such as the Homelessness Steering Committee, Reconnect, Rising Tide are all doing their part as well as events such as the Coldest Nights of the Year fundraiser. The city points at the province to say it's your problem. The province points at the city, which has earmarked $12 million for affordable housing to help get people off the street. The Chamber of Commerce has become involved because of how homelessness is affecting the downtown core. Some people don't feel safe going to work, while other people feel that they're avoiding downtown because of business, downtown businesses because of the problems associated with homelessness, such as drug abuse, begging, and mental health, and a whole host of other things. To actually be homeless here is a whole other matter. What's it like to live on the streets? What's it like not to take meds that help you function? What's it like not knowing where you're going to sleep or eat every day? I've had lots of conversations with people around the building who huddle up in our corners and sit and sleep alongside our foundations. Calling the police isn't always the answer. Some of us argue that homelessness is the result of mental health and addiction. We can build all the apartments we want, but there will still be people who choose to sleep on the street and in tent cities, which definitely aren't the answer. 
As our city grows, so will this problem, and the church has to be part of the conversation. Saying that, I do want to commend Father Chris Van Buskirk at St. George's, who's an active participant in and facilitator of these conversations for the churches. Now, as someone who has been threatened regularly over the years by people outside our doors, I have to resist the temptation to see people as the problem. The congregation God has given me isn't just all of you kind people in these pews. It also occurs to me there's another congregation of God's people who are huddled up outside of our doors, who are physically homeless, but oftentimes spiritually in tune. They always talk about God with me. It doesn't take long for them to say something theological in response to their plight. Yeah, it's hard, but God loves me is kind of a, an often thing that I hear. And true that I'm told sometimes where to go, and not the nicest possible way. But for the most part, people are just hungry. They want a place to sit and to eat. And I always say to them, sit, eat, and then move on. Like, you know, <laughs> don't build a house alongside of the church. The question is, does God care if our stomachs are full? Does God care if we're nourished for the here and now, not some eternal life some other time? Yes, God cares. The story that's directly before this passage for today is about the feeding of 5,000. And in this story, Jesus is very concerned about people's physical needs. Yes, God cares. And the message is the same. Even with the abundance of physical things, we're still hungry. We're still hungry for real bread, for faith that nourishes, for a life that matters throughout the darkest parts of the night. The central Christian practice of sharing communion is a definitive sign of how all that comes from God is to be offered back to God and shared with our neighbors, distributed from the table. And one of the greatest truths the church has taught me is one of the great lessons of faith. There's a place at the table for everyone here. Whether it's sharing in communion, whether it's one of our old potlucks that we used to have, you are all welcome. Inclusion, nourishment, family, community, conversation, laughter, sacredness. Eating a meal is very much part of the gospel. People eating a meal with Jesus has led to some of the most powerful moments in our sacred texts. You don't get to know someone until you sit down and break bread with them. We find ourselves today in one of those situations, not in a house, which is so often the case, or in a room, but out by the lake. It's the aftermath of the feeding of the multitude with the loaves and the fish that the young boy gave to Jesus. And we're in the midst of what one commentator describes as a story about bread, but not about bread. It's a story about the meaning of Jesus. The crowd is after him again. New Testament scholar Alice McKenzie puts it this way. The renewed growling of their stomachs is their signal to seek him out again. The crowd are wanting more food because they're hungry, but what they get here is not the same bread as the previous day. In fact, this time Jesus says, I offer myself to you. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Yeah, years ago, when I first got here, there was one of those big roast beef suppers down in the basement that the men used to do. And there was this knock on the door, and an obviously distressed person was standing there saying, um, could I get some food? And I was like, did you buy a ticket? I didn't, I didn't say that, but that was my thought. And then I looked and I thought, okay, hang on a second. You, you just wait right there. I went into the kitchen. I said, someone's at the door who needs food. And just like that, two plates worth of food was put on one plate and he was sent out with a bag of rolls. And I thought, yeah, that's church. This is what we do. We feed people who knock on our door. This, there's a prayer that comes from a Christian community in Lima, Peru, which they say a communion, and this is the prayer. God, food of the poor, Christ, our bread, give us a taste of the tender bread from your creation's table, bread newly taken from your heart's oven, food that comforts us and nourishes us, a fraternal loaf that makes us human, joined hand in hand, working and sharing, a warm loaf that makes us family, sacrament of your body, your wounded people. So what is it that makes Jesus the bread of life for you? What makes all of this together nourishing? What is it about being together that sustains us, whether it's been online or in person? 
For me, it's the solidarity. I've spoken a lot about this over the years, that what drew me into the church and eventually into the gospel was our togetherness, that there were people who knew me that I didn't know, that cared about me, that whose names I didn't know, people who prayed for me that I didn't even know existed, and vice versa. There's something wonderful about that concentrated goodness. I posted on Facebook that it was going to be Lois Weatherby's birthday, and there were more comments on that post than any church service I've posted in the last year. Happy birthday, friend. Let's give Lois a little applause. Yo, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Did you get a lot? Oh, good, yeah. yeah. Your ear is sore. <laughs> and phone, lots of phone calls, that's good. You know, it's one of the things that when all of this started to happen, we couldn't figure out what to do together. And all of a sudden, we were watching services on YouTube. We were phoning people. People in the congregation were sending in videos of themselves reading scripture in their kitchens and living rooms. We had people sending in videos of themselves singing songs. And then the vaccine rolled out. It felt like it was one more thing that we could do together as a church, as a witness to our care and concern for our community. It was exciting hearing people talking about their vaccine when it wasn't yet available to everyone who wanted one. We said one time during our Zoom Bible studies that there would become a time when we won't be asking who got their vaccine, it will be who hasn't gotten their vaccine. And now the question is, why haven't you? And here together this morning, we're reminded of how fortunate we are to share in the good news of Jesus Christ in this place because he is the bread of life. I've told you all recently, I confessed about my abiding love of tartar sauce. Well, I'm convinced sometimes that I only eat soup because I love bread so much. I almost ate, once I almost ate all the bread at Ann and Ralph Smith's house because the soup was so good. At my last church, one old lady figured out that she could get more visits from me if she baked me fresh bread. She was such a character, and she has this really thick Cape Breton accent, and she'd call me up and she'd say, the bread was looking for you, and do you know what it said to me? It said, where's Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> At which point I said, okay, I'll be right up. But then, with the onset of dementia for her, baking bread became more difficult. And I'd sit and ask her, tell me about your day, what do you do? And she'd say, every morning I get up. I sit in my rocking chair in this very hot kitchen with a wood stove and I'd read scripture and pray. This woman was one of these people who didn't have very much. And in many ways, she had everything. She put on a pot of tea and she'd start baking bread. Eventually, we'd get her to start making bread for our communion services. St. Paul writes, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragment offering and sacrifice to God. Whether that fragrant offering is the fresh smell of bread or the smell of justice rolling down from God's holy mountain for the people of God who walk our city streets who are at, or who are at the mercy of this terrible global pandemic or suffering because of climate change and war, that's our offering to give back what we have received, to find our purpose in this world, not only as Christians, but as a congregation. Presbyterian minister Frederick Beekner said it well, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place where God calls you to is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And I've met people who have found that purpose and there's a certain glow when they speak. I also thought of the quote by Olympic runner Eric Liddell who was portrayed in the movie Chariots of Fire, who was asked about his decision to forego theological seminary in order to complete, compete in the Olympics, he said, God made me fast, and when I run, I give him glory. Now, I'm open-minded enough to know that, that bread is a different thing for everyone. What is your bread? What is it you need to give to the world to help them be sustained? I was reading an article by scripture scholar Walter Brueggemann, whose friend had died, and they often discussed what the concept of bread was in scripture, what bread of life meant, what is bread, and how is it to be delivered. 
and they concluded that through government policy, action organizations, and local volunteers, the bread given by God is made available through human agency. They had no doubt that it, is, it was God who gives the bread, but they insisted that bread from God is not magical, it is not supernatural, it is rather the faithful, proper functioning of the human community that makes bread available. It's the human performance of mercy, compassion, and generosity that constitute the delivery system for God's bread. And so when we pray for daily bread, we may also be grateful for the actions of government, human organizations, and human volunteers who function to deliver daily bread, most among those who possess no bread of their own. And here we are and the grips of a virus that won't let us go among a population of people who think it's inconvenient to wear a mask, who listen to guys on YouTube for their science rather than the medical community, the devastation caused by COVID-19 is a summons to us as the church to live into our relationship with God more deeply, to care more, to follow Jesus more closely, and to feed his sheep and to minister to the world around us in his name. He is the bread of life. And if he says if we believe in him, we will have eternal life. And we have eternal life when we care about the people that Jesus cared about, when we do the things that we can do as citizens and as a church to protect the world around us, like getting a vaccine, like wearing a mask. The only thing is, in order to live, we have to help our neighbors live too. The economy is for God, which means it is also for my neighbor. It is for my neighbor, which means it is also for God. No, okay. Let us pray. O God, who brings good things to those who hunger and thirst. Your care for us is shown in how the world is turned upside down for us. In the wilderness, your children ate bread which came from the skies. Your presence and care was shown by water which gushed forth from a rock. Bread from the sky, water from the ground. We pray, O God, that we continue to follow you in this world, to make sure that the hungry are fed, the skeptical transformed. And you come to us today offering yourself as the bread of eternal life, offering your very self that we might be filled, forgiven, and made whole. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, scandalous God, God of a world turned upside down. We pray for a world which needs to be changed, where power needs to be exercised in the service of the weakest, where the haves need to recognize the have-nots, where weapons need to be transformed into welcome signs. We pray for our country, that we may empower those who struggle for justice, fairness, and peace. Hear us as we pray for our city of Moncton, for those who lead, administer, teach, care, and support. Grant that we who live here might hear again the word of your prophet that in the city's welfare, we will find our welfare. And we pray for your church, that it too might know the unsettling, upsetting stir of the Spirit's breath in its life and work. And we continue to pray together the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So just as a reminder, as we leave, we'd ask you just to do so distant. So whoever you came with, just try to stay six feet apart from whoever's ahead of you. Or, uh, and let's just, we can do this and uh, um, keep each other safe that way. And um, I want to say thank you for coming today and for being with us online or in person. And um, it's nice to be back. Thank you for allowing me to go on vacation and play in the water with my kids and my dog and read books and 
drink lots of tea and have campfires and those kinds of things. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. May we go forth nourished by the bread of life within us. Our spiritual hunger and thirst is satisfied when we honor the God within us. Life is short. Be kind to one another. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. Our closing hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See. <laughs>